Most investors feel comfortable with their domestic equity and bond portfolios because they tend to thrive during periods of economic growth and low inflation. And we don't blame you. It's been a great ride. But it's a big world out there, full of opportunities you may be ignoring. Sadly, we live in a world dominated by a fear of missing out, or FOMO. And in the last 10 years, U.S. equities and bonds have outperformed and generated massive amounts of FOMO. This hasn't always been the case. In the mid-2000s, the best performing markets were international equities, especially emerging markets, golden commodities. So what happens if growth collapses and inflation becomes the new norm? Or what if the U.S. dollar collapses and U.S. assets are no longer attractive? What will the new FOMO markets be? And will your portfolio keep up or be left behind? Enter Rational Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation Fund, ticker RDMIX, a strategy that is designed to thrive across different markets and economic regimes. Unlike most traditional strategies that keep allocation static and let volatility happen, Adaptive Asset Allocation applies a proprietary systematic process designed to dynamically transition toward thriving asset classes and eliminate those that are not, all the while aiming for consistent volatility and stable returns. There's almost always a bull market somewhere in the world. Don't let yesterday's FOMO get in the way of tomorrow's opportunities. Instead, let Adaptive Asset Allocation help you fill in your domestic portfolio gaps. To learn more, visit RationalMF.com and check out the Rational Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation Fund. And now for something completely different. Welcome to Resolve Riffs. Um, we've got a really neat departure today from, from some of our more regular uh, themes. Um, so today we've got Brian Moriarty, who is head of fixed income uh, research at Morningstar Research. And um, we've also got Dave Nadig, who is Chief Futurist at Vetify, Financial Futurist at Vetify. Um, so we're going to rock and roll today. Um, Mike, I guess you better do your usual. Oh, uh, everything is advice. No, wait, wait. That's not. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's advice. Wide ranging conversation. Going to have some fun. Hey, we had the demise of a monstrous financial institution in Europe. Like this is not a small thing. Just a poop vanished and then we get, now we get to get into layer cake and the you know nothing gets me more excited than a little bit of the stack of capital and understanding <laughs> who gets what when shit goes wrong that is what i'm the most excited because it's never what you quite expect right it's never quite what you expect and so uh when i heard brian and uh dave you the three of us were chatting uh Usually Adam would have been there, but about the sort of the stuff that you were running across in this, in this demise of uh, credit Suisse, man, I'm just, it's fascinating to me. So we thought we'd get you on here and, uh, and have a good chat about it. So by the way, none of this is advice in, in any way will we be held accountable for its accuracy. So with that, <laughs> I haven't, even, I haven't even been accurate about poor Brian's title, right? So he's, <laughs> he's a, I just, cause I know he's going to get in trouble. It's associate director of fixed income at Morningstar research services for the record. So let's um, now, Brian, with that said, why don't you uh, go ahead and give a little bit more detail about your role at Morningstar Research Services and why you happen to be particularly well suited to talk to us today about what happened uh, last week with Credit Suisse. Sure, yeah. So um, as noted, I'm Associate Director of Fixed Income Manager Research at Morningstar Research Services. Um, and so I cover, monitor, um, rate um, public fixed income funds, Metropolitan West Total Return Bond, um, PIMCO Total Return, not my coverage, but this is what we, the people we interact with, the funds that we're covering and rating. Um, and so we spend, I spend most of my time uh, in the weeds on the portfolio construction and decision-making of public fixed income mutual funds. And the genesis of this conversation um, really started uh, at the end of last year, um, when I noticed that Credit Suisse was showing up as an overweight trade in a number of public fixed income portfolios. Um, but to get to there 
and what happened in the last two weeks, we kind of have to start big picture. Um, we'll start at 2008 and then funnel our way down um, to the current time period. And I'll, I'll move through this pretty quickly in this beginning part so we can spend um, most of the conversation on the really interesting stuff that happened in the last few weeks. Uh, but just to start, um, one thing that we've observed for a long time is that um, core and core plus um, mutual funds, fixed income mutual funds, um, are pretty consistently overweight to financials. Um, and a big reason for that and relative to the, to the aggregate index. And the big reason for that comes out of 2008, Dodd-Frank, the Basel III Accords, right? This was the um, financial regulator's response to the global financial crisis was to put a lot of regulations in place on banks. And part of those regulations require banks, as at least the, the regulated ones, the GSIBs, globally systemically important banks, um, to issue an extremely full capital structure uh, with equity, preferreds, um, all sorts of subordinated, seniors, unsecured. And they have to have a certain amount of capital issued um, to fulfill their regulatory requirements. Uh, and that makes them pretty unique compared to a traditional U.S. corporate. And when we get to it, I can sort of put up a very, very simple example of the differences between a couple of different cap structures. Uh, but because of how full a bank's cap structure is, um, that's one of the reasons why we tend to see them as an overweight in actively managed public fixed income funds, uh, because there's just so much there for an asset manager to um, pick between and pick from and play different parts of the capital structure that aren't always there for, let's say, a high yield um, company that might only have one high yield bond outstanding for, you know, let's say four or five, seven billion dollars compared to a massive cap structure on JP Morgan or Credit Suisse. Um, so from an active manager's perspective, it's viewed as a very fertile hunting ground, uh, more ideas, more opportunities, whether that's actually true or not, um, sort of ex post returns, I'm not sure, but that has been the uh, approach to that market. Um, at the same time, um, because of the size of this market, uh, asset managers themselves of a certain size almost have to participate um, in this market that includes banks overall, as well as the $270 billion uh, AT1 market that we'll talk about later. Um, and finally, the belief that um, you know, banks and financial companies will do well in a rising rate environment, which we've seen in the last few years, obviously, um, because net interest margin expands, right? The interest that these banks can collect on new loans is higher than what they have to pay out on a deposit rate. We've seen that become a big topic of conversation uh, in the last few weeks. Um, and so that's sort of the, the thesis that has least has been cited to us recently over the last year or two as the reason for the overweight. Um, however, I do want to point out again, like this is a pretty persistent overweight. So it can change in size, but um, it's not like asset managers are going way underweight um, and then way overweight. This is a pretty persistent, I think, because of the overall size of this market and the fact that asset managers tend to be biased towards corporates in general relative to the ag. Um, so that's the initial setup. Um, from there, I can move into the Credit Suisse um, trade setup, or we can stop and take a look at. Well, that's sort of why you capital. were particularly motivated to dig into this, or or maybe why you've got a particular expertise here, right? Because you're analyzing the decision making and the holdings at actively managed fixed income funds, and so you know it behooves you, therefore, to get expertise in. The complexities of the capital structure of these banks, since there's it's fertile ground for active managers to to pick away at that capital structure because it's complex, it's hard to analyze, it requires more expertise, and therefore, in theory, it presents more opportunities for active alpha. Um, okay, that makes sense. Um, I also think it makes sense for us to kind of, and this probably is where you're going next, but. Um, would you say that the the capital structure of banks got substantially more complicated after the 2008 global financial crisis? Yes, <laughs> yes, they did. Um, it's probably, I can, I think that makes sense to, to throw up um, a, an example here, um, just to make it easy to talk about. It's not very easy to um, 
imagine the capital structure unless you do it a lot. Um, so let me put this. Brian, while you're grabbing the chart, you talked about this being an overweight, like how much of an overweight when you, I mean, are we talking about portfolios where this is 10%, you know, credit suisse exposure is 10% of a portfolio, or are we talking, you know, between 10 basis points and a percent kind of thing? Um, no. So um, it is actually, I had a chart for that and I thought it would be too boring to look at because it's just numbers, but well, the, you overweight, boring, so. <laughs> the overweight tends to be um, between one and a half and four percentage points. Um, at least I only look back through the beginning of 2018. Um, I can do it further. I will do it further as my work on this progresses. Um, but it was at the average. So I took the average of core and core plus mutual funds, combined them into one because they're typically all, all benchmarked to the ag. Um, and the ag's allocation to financials is typically around seven to 8%. Um, so one and a half to, to four percentage points higher than that on average. Uh, in some cases, it can be significantly higher than uh, than the ag. Um, so this is, you'll have to forgive my, this is obviously a very simple, just Excel spreadsheet that I was putting together for my own benefit before this all started. Um, and this is a, I want to be clear, this is very simplified even from what it is in reality, but um, it's enough to sort of make sense of it. Um, so I got three different banking regimes on the left and then a traditional U.S. corporate on the right. Um, uh, regulated banks are all required to issue equity, um, common equity tier one um, at the very bottom. Um, above that uh, is the preferred or AT1 market. Um, now in the U.S. they're preferred shares, in Europe they're AT1s, um, and there are differences between them. They fill the same role in the capital structure. And they both end up in preferred indexes, preferred funds, et cetera. They're very similar. But there are some important differences, um, which we can flip to um, in a minute. Um, and then above that um, is sort of tier two or subordinated debt. Um, and then senior unsecured, seniors, and then deposits above that. Um, you've also got the hold co holding company versus operating company, OPCO distinction, right? So typically, opco debt is senior to hold co debt. That isn't always the case in the UK. It's sort of flipped for some reason. I don't know why that is. Um, at least at the bottom. Um, and this sort of collapsed a lot of, like I said, this is collapses some of the nuance. For example, um, the counterparties um, to these banks, which is a very important um, point because I think with Credit Suisse and also with Lehman way back when sort of their death knell was when their counterparties decided, hey, it's too much of a risk to do business with you. That's really the last gasp of any bank, uh, in my opinion. Those uh, exist, those claims, counterparty claims exist at the OPCO senior level, so right below deposits. Right. And and Brian, and I think I'm right that when most people talk about some of the derivative products that get run out of these balance sheets, like things like structured products, or uh, in my world, the exchange traded note or exchange traded loan market, my understanding is most of that's coming in at the you know the senior unsecured level. Certainly at Credit Suisse, I think almost all of it came in at that hold co senior unsecured level. So you're well out of the danger zone if you're if you're buying some of those sort of more structured products, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The risk, the real risk um, is obviously at the equity level and then the preferreds and subordinated debt. So those are um, obviously considered sort of the first to go. Um, a bail in bond, by the way, this is the term that has also gotten thrown out along with AT1. Uh, a bail in is a bit of a broader definition. So there's regulatory capital which is what is required. They're required to issue it to maintain certain ca uh, capital ratios. And it's the stuff that can be written or triggered down um, to zero or converted into equity. Um, and that's the bottom levels, the tier two or subordinated and then the, the tier one, AT ones. Um, that's the regulatory capital. And then a bail-in bond is stuff above that, the seniors unsecured, and sometimes even the seniors, um, the APCO seniors, a bail-in bond is where the asset, excuse me, the bank can say, you know what, we are choosing ourselves to write this down to zero to help avoid a bailout. Mm -hmm. um, so theoretically, all of this, except for deposits, um, uh, is at risk. But in practice, 
um, this structure has worked quite well. Uh, before Credit Suisse, there was only one uh, instance of an AT1 being written down to zero. That was um, Banco Popular in Spain in 2017. Um, so this, this has worked quite well um, since the financial crisis. Um, Brian, I remember back in, um, in the financial crisis and then again in 2013, um, that there were there was another class of bonds that the banks issued called cocoa bonds. Is is that relevant yeah. here at all? Uh, yeah, very much so. So a cocoa, um, um, a cocoa is an AT1. So all cocos are AT1s. It's contingent convertible, um, but not all AT1s are cocos. Um, and so um, actually, I'll flip to this sort of tier one comp. Let me see if okay. So this is a comparison between a Euro AT1 and a US preferred. So um, they fill, like I said, very similar roles, the same position in the cap structure. They're all both perpetual preferreds, callable after five to 10 years, the same, typically the same credit rating. Um, but the bottom three rows are where you get into the differences. Um, and specifically as it relates to COCOs, and then we can talk about the rest of this, an AT1, um, a European AT1 can have three different types of um, uh, outcomes if it gets tr if its um, clauses are triggered, its contractual clauses are triggered. So if the bank's capital ratios fall below a certain level, it's typically five percent um, for a what's called a, a low trigger cocoa or AT1, and then seven and a half percent for the higher trigger. Um, if it falls below this trigger, then there's one of three outcomes, depending on the contracts in the AT1 prospectus. Um, the first and most common is that it's converted into equity. That's where the COCO comes from, contingent convertible, contingent on the, the clauses being triggered. Um, and now, obviously, or at least we would expect, that would only happen after the equity has gone to zero and then it's converted into new equity. Um, the second type is a temporary write down, meaning you know it's written down to zero um, or partial loss depends on the regulator and the clauses um, to to bring the bank back under or back within its capital ratio requirements, and then at some future date it can be written back up, returned um, once the bank is healthy enough to uh, allow that. And then the third kind is that there is a, uh, what's called a full write down. Um, and that is when it's just written to zero, no possible opportunity for gain, no convert into equity. And um, wouldn't you know it, but Credit Suisse was one of the biggest issuers of full write down um, AT1s. So all of Credit Suisse's AT1s were only full write down. They were not contingent convertibles into equity. Uh, this seems to be a, uniqueness to the Swiss banking structure, although I haven't actually found the regulations that require it. Um, but the Credit Suisse was perhaps the largest issuer of these full write down AT1s. Does anybody want to guess who the second largest issuer is? UBS. UBS. <laughs> oh, no. Got it in one. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the difference um, between Euro AT1s and US preserve preferreds is really in the, the contractual clauses. So AT1s typically have a much higher um, or much more defined contracts, right? At certain levels, they break, they, they trigger their clauses, whereas preferreds are at regulators' discretion um, and the outcomes are less defined um, contractually. And now, is, this, is this also some of the... Um... Uh, so some of the other regulators in the EU have come out and said our our uh, AT ones don't quite work the same way as the Swiss do because you know that obviously there's uh, maybe there's going to be less less uh, appetite for offerings in this now that we've actually seen a trigger event that that writes down yeah. to zero. But is that some of the nuance we're hearing about there on those the sort of the UK sort of says, and I've just yes. this very peripherally. So if you can maybe give some more details on that, it would be great. Yes. Yeah. So that's, that's what the, that's the full write down versus convertible sort of clause. The Swiss ones are only full write down. Most of the rest of Europe is convertible cocoa 
into equity. Gotcha. And they do not have a full write down clause. Right. So that's that nuance. That's the difference yeah. that some people were talking about. I, I, you know, been hearing a few different things and I'm like, I, I don't know. I'm going to talk to a guy on Friday. So. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's the big difference. Yeah. I mean, and it is, um, you know, on March 20th, which we'll get to that, um, uh, pretty quick, right? But on March 20th, after it, it, the market learned, um, it was technically on March 19th that the market learned that the AT1 is being written to zero. That was a Sunday. But on the 20th, first trading day, um, basically the rest of Europe, the ECB, um, European Bank Authority, Bank of England, all came out and said, hey, no, wait, like we're not going to do this. Um, you know, this is a, a unique event. It was very emphatic and very coordinated. Um, I have some thoughts on that that maybe we'll, we'll get to, but um, yeah, they were very clear. Now contractually, right, it can only be converted, right? There is not going to be a tip, a, a similar zeroing, or unlikely, very unlikely to be a similar zeroing, um, uh, even if they run into trouble, right? It'll just be a traditional convert to equity, most, most cases. Was there, so the, so the Swiss is, it's always a zeroing. So it wasn't I believe really like, so, yeah, that's yeah. turning, it's, it's been hard for me to sort of officially confirm that, but every gotcha. every one that I've looked at, every prospectus has been a, a zero, yeah, a full write down. Interesting, because you you um, yeah, so you get a zero write down on these things. You get this hundred billion dollar backup from the Swiss government. It's just an interesting. Yeah, so we'll I'll stop sharing this. Um, do you, do you think that this just kills the market for this? I mean, the reason people have been buying these things obviously was that they were a higher yield vehicle from what they believed was a safe organization, right? So you're, you think you're getting a pretty good deal for the yield you're getting. Obviously, in this case, you weren't. Um, but do you think that this market just disappears? I mean, you know, it, the, the AT1 market is yeah. down like 40% since this happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't. Well, I don't for two reasons. Um, first... They are legally required to issue these securities um, in some combination. Now there there is a what's called a tier two, which sits between the tier one and the subordinated debt or the senior unsecured, depending on the regulatory environment. Um, but that market is much smaller than it used to be, and most of the issuance has gone into the AT1 market. And so I don't see it going away because they are required to issue this. Um, now, maybe their cost of capital goes up as a result of this, right? And they have to just issue with higher coupons. Um, I actually have some, we can look at the prices of some of these in a, in a minute, um, because you can see the effect of rates and stress on um, two different credit suites, AT1 coupons, and drastically different coupons, depending on the environment. Um, I just think that continues to, to be a trend. Um, what we've also seen is that previously, so these are all callable after five to 10 years, and the banks were pretty religious about rolling them and calling them on their first call date. Um, a lot of that price move you've seen has just been the market, these things extending, and, and they're not no longer trading their call date, they're trading to somewhere up to, you know, somewhere beyond as they extended. Um, we might see more of that, right? The market might be less willing to price them to their calls but that's just the market figuring it out, right? Like eventually we'll settle into some new normal. I dislike that term, but that's a, I think that's what will happen, right? And right well, now the market- we, we know that we're gonna be facing a, a dearth of issuance anyway, because if you can avoid rolling, you're not gonna roll 5% yes. up on what you were doing a couple of years ago, right? So yeah. if you've got it sitting yeah. out there, you're gonna let it sit at that lower rate. It's the same problem yeah. with mortgage refunds. Well, right the, the interesting thing, which I didn't have that up there, but most of those, I think all of them, um, are fixed to floating. So if they don't oh, call yeah. them at the call date, right, you end, you still, so it still, still might be, yeah. yeah, but it's still going to be a much more, I think, particular decision. So I think part of the, part of the price volatility, I think is warranted just from the pricing past the call date, but I'm not quite sure yet. I think the verdict is still out. Okay. So, I mean, I wonder, so you still feel like this AT1 market is, is going to be useful for even Swiss banks to tap given well, that, that they yeah. Swiss bank is, is that even plural anymore? <laughs> <laughs> well, so it'll be interesting. I mean, the, 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 no, the Swiss national bank prior to this had been always been pretty clear. Like 
we want two two big Swiss banks. We, they want they liked having two. Um, so I don't know. We haven't learned enough since this came out. It's possible that they attempt to spin out the Credit Suisse's um, Swiss Universal Bank operations and do another another bank. We haven't learned enough about if that will happen or not, but it could. Um, but no, I think to, to Adam to your point, I think that's where more of the damage is going to be, right? Because this UBS AT ones have this are the same as the Credit Suisse AT ones, and the laws that the Swiss government passed to enable this, um, which uh, we can get to, I can read them, um, affect UBS or could affect UBS as well um, if they were to run into a similar problem. So far that hasn't happened yet um, outside of the prices of the AT1s, but uh, it applies, so we'll see. All right. Keep Let's going. Get, I, I'm, I'm on the I, edge of my seat, bro. You no, know, I, I <laughs> want to get more. into the, <laughs> the shenanigans part of this because that's part of what I wanted to really come talk about because I had not yeah. paid much attention to this, but this did not go down like in the normal way. This was not a normal course of business. Like this got like laws passed right ahead of time. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, we'll skip to the write down um, or the week of March 13th. Um, so I'll, I'll go day by day. Um, and then we can, I'll read out the laws that were passed out loud. Um, so March 13th, it was a Monday. That's when the sell-off in Credit Suisse sort of really kicked into gear. Um, and we can look at some, some prices in a minute. Actually, I'll, I'll do that now. I'll put the prices up now. Um, so you can marvel at them while I, uh, while I talk. So while we're while we're on the break there, um, I think Brian, your mic is picking up a little bit of rattling, almost like there's a loose screw mm. in it or something. Uh, no big deal, but if if I if it happens again, I'll let you know and maybe just give it a jiggle because I think you hit your desk a couple times and actually stop doing it. That's kind of how I okay. think I figured okay. out it was you. Yeah, my, mic, yeah, my <laughs> mic's right here. Like it's the same. It's yeah. so let me know. Um, yeah. Okay, so March thirteenth is when the sell off and the credit suite bonds really um, picked up. Um, March 14th, um, they finally released their annual report. It had been delayed by a week um, because U.S. regulators had some comments on it. Um, and when they finally released it on March 14th, they admitted to a material weakness um, in their financial controls. Um, they also stopped paying bonuses to the board um, because of that. Um, March 15th is the when the Saudi National Bank says absolutely not if they're going to inject more capital, which triggers the big panic, the, the equity sells off, I think 20 or 24% that day. Um, but at the same time, same day, March 15th, uh, FINMA, the Swiss financial regulator, confirms that Credit Suisse is solvent. They sort of say, hey, no, this is, it's okay. Now, of course they're gonna say that, but they said it publicly, which is important for what's about to happen. Um, March 16th, the Swiss government issues a statement of support for Credit Suisse and then approves a new liquidity line for them to draw on. Um, uh, and then after that same day, but after they approve the liquidity line, they pass um, a new law, which um, let, I will read out. Um, so FINMA confirms the creditworthiness of the borrower or confirms the existence of a restructuring plan. Now, they did that, they confirmed the creditworthiness of the borrower the day before on March 15th when they said it was solvent. And Credit Suisse had been trying to execute a very robust restructuring plan, which is part of why um, it was showing up as a big trade, a big overweight in a lot of um, fixed income funds. So, but goes on, if the borrower is part of a financial group, this is related to the hold co, it confirms for the entire group. So, but this is saying they confirmed it, this happened, it was credit worthy and it had a restructuring plan. So that was the law that was passed on March 16th. On March 17th, um, the Wall Street Journal reports that Credit Suisse saw deposit outflows of $10 billion in the last week. Um, huge outflows from the deposit base. They had already been under outflow pressure on their deposits in 2022, especially the fourth quarter, like way before the SVB stuff happened. 
and banks were like, oh, should we raise our deposit rates to keep people from freaking out or whatever, all the other stuff that happened um, during and after SVB, Credit Suisse had already been seeing deposit outflows and that accelerated um, this week. Um, and then March um, 19th, which is a Sunday, um, another law was passed. Um, they announced that UBS was taking over. Another law was passed and the AT1s, excuse me, were zeroed. Um, the, the other law that was passed, um, the literal law is at the time the loan is approved, and this is referring to the liquidity lifeline that the government threw Credit Suisse on the 16th. Uh, at the time the loan is approved in accordance with Article 5, that was the first law I read, FINMA can order the borrower to write off additional tier one capital. And that's why they were zero. So they literally just made up wow. a capability that did not exist and yes. then basically said, now go do that thing. Yes. Yeah. It's so wild. here there's, there's additional commentary. This is uh, from the same law, but additional commentary. In this context, FINMA can order as soon as the commitment credit is approved. That's the lifeline. Um, the amortization of additional tier one capital. The order can be, the order in question can be addressed to the borrower and to the group. That's Opco versus Holdco. Um, now, this is important as well. The amortization of additional tier one capital may also be ordered with a view to a takeover or repurchase scenario without which the borrower would have immediately been found insolvent. So that is where the zero came from. Yeah. That's wild. I got to hand it to that coordinated effort. Yeah. To make all of this stuff happen. I mean, on the one, with, with uh, yeah, on the one hand, I'm just government in awe of, an, or, of a government that can act that quickly to pass the actual yes. law. <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. It's one thing if a regulator comes in and just puts a stamp on something, but this is a whole different thing. Oh, I know, right? Well, when you're when your whole economy is is hey, we're the bank that banks, we're the country that banks the world. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you got a credibility issue, you're gonna have to get on it. Now, is there any is there any implication for <laughs> the other Swiss bank slash banks? As, as Mike was well, saying, are there more than one? I mean, yes, there are, but still. Yeah, I mean, so all the laws that were passed can be used on any Swiss bank, right? So yeah, so those are now laws unless they, I don't know, once this is complete and approved, right? Because it still has the merger actually hasn't happened yet, um, or been approved or confirmed. Um, Maybe they go and they, they strike them out after it's done, right? And just go back to the way things were. I don't know. Um, but at, at the moment, yeah, they apply to the whole Swiss banking um, market. It sounds like there was um, s at least some reasonable an ambiguity about where AT1s stood in the capital waterfall prior to the Swiss government and the Swiss regulators changing the laws. Why do you think they change the laws in this direction to zero out the AT1s rather than yeah. um, allowing equity to be, to be wiped out first? And I mean, it just seems to me to make it a lot harder to issue that kind of capital going forward for for UBS, if you know, with with this new perception of the of the capital waterfall, any intuitions yes. on that? Yeah. So there's um, a firm answer to part of that, and a speculative answer to the other part. So on the more concrete oh, side, we got we got that peanut running around in your uh, microphone. How about now? Oh, it's definitely, can you try and tighten your microphone? It might be like the vibrations or is there a screw on it or something? How about now? Yep, that's better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's just it's just a clip. I don't know. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, the, on the, on whether this, there was some ambiguity. Um, and I, I, that was my initial reaction was first, it's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they did this. Then I swung the way opposite side and said, oh, well, of course, it was in the prospectus. Um, in the Where it shows up in the prospectus is not in one of the contractual clauses, um, but in the sort of list of risk factors that comes at the end of any prospectus. 
Um, and it was just given, it was thrown in as an example of what might happen. But right before that, in like two lines above it, it said, oh, well, we're going to respect like this will happen in order of what the normal waterfall. So it was, it was very uh, ambiguous. And I think it was ambiguous enough that there is a legitimate sort of legal effort underway now to sue. Um, so even though the AT1s technically have been zeroed, um, I've been able to find some prices on them in the low single dollar range since then. And some hedge funds are, have been buying them up um, over the counter as a form of litigation finance, I think. So we'll see, but the story might not be, be over yet. But to the point where people think that they have a legitimate legal claim here. Um, and I think, so that's, I think the fact that they had, that the Swiss felt like they needed to pass a law to make this happen, I think that answers the question of would this have held up in court without that, right? Um, now, maybe they're just being, you know, covering all their bases, but I think that's sort of the key fact. The law is really the, the giveaway um, that they... Uh, that there was ambiguity before, right? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. what was the value of the AT1s, of Credit Suisse's AT AT1s? Like, how much are we talking about that they zeroed out? Uh, 16 or 17 billion US dollars. Okay, yeah. So not peanuts, right? So yeah. is it is it reasonable then to say that, um, well, actually, let me start with, what would happen, do you think, to UBS, to the merger, to the Swiss banking system, if that um, zeroing out of AT1s is overturned and instead they adhere to the traditional waterfall? What would be the implications to the banking system, do you think? I think um, I'm going to sort of invert that um, mm. and try to answer it a different way. So I think the fact that they, the way that they did this seems to indicate to me, and this is where we enter this speculative part of the conversation, that they were, I think, pretty clearly not operating from a purely pure market perspective. There was politics and emotions involved in this decision. Um, now, obviously, they wanted to protect the equity holders of Credit Suisse. Um, from what we can tell, it's pretty clear that they um, that Credit Suisse equity was widely held within Switzerland, so they're protecting their their demographic, their voter base. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, you could say, oh, well, what about the Saudis or other you know, owners, I, personally, I think that that was less of a concern than the home, the home ownership, the home base, excuse me, the constituents. Um, at the same time, they apparently did not at all entertain the bid from BlackRock, the potential bid from BlackRock, um, which tells me, again, they wanted to handle this internally. Um, I think maybe the insularness of the Swiss banking um, industry, right, what made it so attractive um, historically also made them really reluctant to violate sort of their their neutrality, if you will, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think that played a big role into that. Um, and maybe the concern was, well, so if they, they want to solve it internally, this is a Swiss problem, it requires a Swiss solution, UBS. Mm -hmm. UBS clearly didn't want to do this, right? Their first offer was a low ball. So how do you strong arm UBS into doing this? Well, what are UBS's requirements? Well, they don't want to swallow another $17 billion of debt. And maybe UBS held a lot of credit suisse equity. So here's the, you know, here's the outcome. Um, I don't know how they're going to perceive or, you know, react to the outside market's reaction to this decision, right? Meaning the pricing of Swiss, uh, Swiss AT1s and maybe outflows from the Swiss banking market, because now look at what you've done. And this is the Swiss we're talking about. This isn't, um, you know, Italy or Spain. So I don't, I don't know. I frankly, I think that's a very 
unanswered question that's going to take years to answer. It, it seems to me like that has to be a black eye on the, the Swiss banking sector yes. as, an, and, as an entity, because not only with this, we've also got sort of numerous sort of accusations of, you know, things that the Swiss have been doing to help U.S. customers in ways they shouldn't have oh, been yeah. doing. Like, so all of the sort of Swiss privacy stuff seems to have had a lot of, you know, chinks in that armor over the last decade, frankly, but certainly yeah. more now. And now we've got the sort of independence of the Swiss banking system sort of in question because it's sort of now just governmental fiat who wins and who loses. Uh, it seems to me it's a pretty strong signal that you're not going to see, you know, billionaires parking quite so much wealth over there. Yeah. I mean, I think that has to be an outcome to this. Now. I also now, wonder, they're... you know, to the extent, is this a systemic risk? Like if, if there, if it turns out that there's a, a valid legal case against the um, Swiss regulator, against the Swiss National Bank, um, I mean that's clearly why investors are buying these AT ones at prices above zero. They're speculating that there may be a legal case. I guess what I'm wondering is, um, is the price of Credit Suisse AT ones? now an interesting potential indicator of escalation of systemic risk that could the, the context there would be if you're going to force the um, swiss national bank or the swiss regulators to flip-flop on their decision to wipe out at1s and instead adhere to the typical capital waterfall and wipe out shareholders would that represent a reinterpretation of the systemic risk of the Swiss banking system? Would UBS have the option to renege on that deal? Like, yeah. I'm just, this seems to me to be, this uncertainty and ambiguity seems to be both um, maybe an underpriced systemic risk um, and AT1 bond, bond prices may be underappreciated as a potential canary in the coal, uh, coal mine. Yeah, event. I don't. Yeah, um, I think obviously there's huge ramifications to this that we don't, you know, the ripples we don't see that we don't don't know them all yet. Um, when it comes to the AT1 market broadly, I mean, yeah, it's traded down huge. I don't know if Dave, do you still have that picture of the index? We can throw that up. Um, at the same time, like uh, asset managers that run like corporate or excuse me financials heavy strategies um or have expertise in this market they've just been gobbling these things up not outside of the swiss market right but you know um english bank at1s continental europe the ones that don't have this full write down feature um that's been it's presented a pretty big buying opportunity to them now whether this they rebound right and the market gets over what's going on i assume i'm going to assume that they will price somewhere between where they're at now or have been versus historical right because like i said before they're not all trading the call now um i think that's the most likely outcome but yes i think there is if if people obviously banking is a trust system um, not just a financial system and if banks can't trust their regulators, excuse me, investors can't trust their regulators, I think that's a huge... That's, which which yeah. investors can trust their regulators to do what for whom? Yeah. Well, I think that, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like never, I don't think like really when has a regulator acted against the, the capital markets so directly? I don't, I don't know. I mean, obviously that's, that's a big question. Inspiring. I think yeah. Where are UBS AT1s trading? Are they are they trading substantially lower now that they've that the Swiss government has made explicit how they're going to treat them? Yeah, I don't know the price right now, but yes, they're down. I think they're down at least at least thirty points. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, did you, did you have that so. chart, Dave? Or I have the uh, I have the index for all the yeah. uh, euro denominated. Which, if you throw that up, you'll see yeah. that's down. I mean, you know, I think twenty five percent denominated. Presumably, are they or are they euro denominated? The, the credit. This is the broad. This is the broad big index. So this is hitting the entire AT one market in Europe. Um, so it's not specifically, but you can see it's just obviously crushed this as part of the capital structure for everybody, right? Everybody, mm. everybody suffers when something like this happens. 
I it doesn't see much way around it. But I mean, again, you have to ask then, does that create an opportunity for buyers, right? Because do you really believe yeah. that UBS is the next one that's going to go under and they're going to wipe out the AT ones there too? That seems like you got to be pretty catastrophizing to get there. It is interesting though that, I mean, the regulator, the Swiss banking regulator yeah. flip-flopped on on its banking on banking rules in the in the span of a weekend the swiss and yeah. yet and yet investors are now believing that the other european regulators are not going to flip flop when the chips are down it's um it's yeah so that's my that that's where my logic has sort of taken me is everybody came out ecb bank of england all came out like hey we're not going to do this this is not you're not going to see this repeated, but at the same time, like a new president precedent has been set. Like if they are, if their backs are up against the wall, if there's some sort of political decision, right? This was a political and emotional decision from, uh, from the Swiss regulators. There's no, if a, a similar central bank is in the same, um, situation, like Man. I view this as it, this is it's no longer zero, right? The risk it's, of this it's almost happen. like the opposite of the Fed put. It's like a Fed call. <laughs> they yeah. just get to come in and smack somebody because they feel well, like it's, it's the covered call, really. It's short call. <laughs> it's shorter call. Yeah. Yeah. So what um what other banks in in Europe? Um I mean, I know Credit Suisse was a bit of a special case, the way that um Silicon Valley Bank was a bit of a special case for completely different reasons. But um but I know that they were a, a special case. Um, what are some other potential um, nexuses of, of risk in the in the European banking system? And, and you know, for those who want to pay attention, you know, and I don't want you know associate director of fixed income research at Morningstar to trigger a bank run here. But I'm just like I'm just I'm curious. <laughs> I was curious kind of generally, like what, what what kind of bond indices would would be most likely to flash to, to provide warning signs first. I, I think what Adam's trying to ask is now that the tide is rolling out, can you point us to the naked swimmers? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, this is not, I haven't taken a closer look at this. I mean, I think the gut reaction is Deutsche Bank, um, but that isn't, like Deutsche is nowhere near as widely held, at least from what I can tell. And I haven't taken a super close look at this yet, but um, it's not as widely held as Credit Suisse was in public fixed income funds. Um, and it is still healthier than Credit Suisse was, which is funny to, you know, obviously Deutsche has its has had its own, um, you know, long history of problems. Um, but it had it had recently sort of been you know I don't want to say turned around but it had been in better shape. Um, now the they have different right that's they don't follow the same Swiss banking rules. Um, their AT ones have a different structure. They have a different cap stack. So I, they have not been under the same deposit outflow pressure that Credit Suisse was. So I think the market that was like the market basically went SVB. Who's the next weakest link? Credit Suisse, and then who? The market, you know, it, it, where is the market um, gonna gonna push around? Who's the market gonna push around next? And after Credit Suisse was Deutsche, and then, frankly, from our perspective, that mar that chatter has already sort of dissipated in the last couple of days. Yeah. Uh, yeah, who knows? Sure. Right? Like, I think, and I think Sands deposit outflows, like that's the that's the killer. Deposit outflows, and then counterparties. And as long as that neither of those two things happen to a large degree, I don't think we see contagion. I think those are the two sort of determinant, you know, factors. There were two holes in the dike. We we got two thumbs and we put them in the holes, and now we're yeah. we're in good shape. Oh, we're on metaphor fire. Yeah, I mean, Metaphorically, <laughs> we're on fire. <laughs> I mean, it's still worth pointing out that we do have plenty of banks that have large held to maturity positions that probably should be marked to market. Like, I don't think all the pain yes. is over, yeah. but it does no, seem like no. most of the rest of it is fairly predictable. I mean, you can go pull up yeah. how upside down people are in their bond portfolios 
for yes. every major bank yeah. now. And we all know how to look at that. So it doesn't feel to yeah. me like there's a giant unknown unknown that feels yeah. scary. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like there is. Yeah. That's a really good point. Right. Because I think that one of the knock on effects, at least as it, it most relates to my work, is that overweight to financials that's been there for years. Like, does that change? Right. Is the market and what does that do? You know, if the trillion dollar plus asset management industry is no longer overweight financials, what does that do to their cost of capital? What is, you know, what is the knock on effects of that? Because if they are forced to raise deposit rates, which you would think they would be, but obviously I think that hasn't necessarily happened yet, um, at least for somebody like JP Morgan, you know, do, does the thesis for owning them, the, the stated thesis that you know, net interest margins are going to expand, that goes away. No, that's TBD. If it does go away, we haven't actually seen that yet, but I think that's the risk. And then you get into you know, what happens when all of that money is no longer persistently overbuying part of the market. Um, I do want to put up. Um, can, can we, uh, yeah, can we come back? I just want to make sure you cover one thing. Uh, yeah. Because we want to talk about, so AT, AT1's got written down to zero, but that had a, a follow on effects to the rest of the capital stack. And yes. they yeah. were, they were a little bit counterintuitive. So I don't know if that's where you're going next. If you are awesome. Or if you have yes, a plan, no, it, yeah, just that's make perfect. Sure we, it is. we get to talk about it. And then yeah. I'm wondering, as an as sort of addendum to that sort of question or feature, if we think about so there was 16 billion of approximately uh, AT1s that went to zero. And then what was the appreciation of the other bonds? There's a spoiler alert. And and was it offsetting? And then who owned what? So yep. was it a calculation across the board of okay well we've got institutional investors that own this and they also tend to own this other thing yes yeah, so um i just i um, i put up or put in a um a new spreadsheet to share um with some of that so let me make this a little bit bigger so we can i don't know how hard this is to read sorry um but this is a couple of different um funds that i picked out one to get a, a decently broad spectrum, but also that sort of rose to the top. So the material columns are here. This one, E and F, that's his total Credit Suisse exposure. And then this is their AT1 exposure. Um, now, a quick caveat, this is not necessarily up to date. So the portfolio date here is the column that this data is based off of. Um, and they don't have to submit, it's not, they're not ETFs, sorry, Dave. Uh, they don't have to submit their portfolios daily. Um, and so we won't always know, obviously, day by day, um, what's happening in the portfolios. But this is sort of a great example of the Credit Suisse trade that they were very overweight. A number of managers were very overweight, this name, but they were playing it differently depending on you know their assessment, their risk appetite, and so on. Um, and so just as an example, um, I'll look at um, Invesco Core Plus. They had a pretty big Credit Suisse bet, um, about a third of which was in AT1 exposure. And they ended up doing um, very badly on March 20th and then um, for that, that sort of full week um, compared to a lot of peers. Um, and what happened, what Mike, what you're getting at is that on March 20th, which was the day that they were marked to zero in these portfolios, right? It happened on the 19th, but the first day that Navis struck is the 20th. Um, the AT1s went to zero. But the, um, the senior bonds, um, which I had up in that other chart, they all spiked. They had been trading down in the 70, 60 to $70 range. They all spiked back up to over 90, um, close to 100 just in that day. Um, so if you had been buying them last in the last week, the prior week at, you know, in the 70, 65, $80 range, you in one day picked up a pretty nice return. Um, and since then, they've traded even higher. I, I looked at one this morning, it was at 102. Because what's happening is that the Credit Suisse senior unsecured bonds, which is where a lot of this exposure is, right? If it's not AT1 in this chart, if it's not AT1, it's senior unsecured. Um, what happened is that they traditionally traded at much wider spreads than UBS senior unsecured, given the relative health and strength of the banks. And what's happening now is that the market expects those two spreads to converge in some fashion to some degree. Um, and so as a result, 
people who own senior and secureds, not all of them, from what we can tell, sold them right away. A lot of them are holding on to it because they expect prices to grind even higher as the spreads converge, which is, seems to have started to happen already. So um, can, I, can I ask you a question, Brian? Because you, you talk to yeah. these folks, right? I mean, this is your job. You're one of those folks that actually talks to PMs and tries to yeah. understand the, the way different individual PMs trade and how they think about credit. So I look at the yeah. Western asset blocks here, who, who are both obviously, both these funds are big owners, but also kind of miraculously, they go from having really terrible day to having their book flat at the end of this period, which, you know, I think most people would consider that a pretty winning trade if you were a major holder of anything with Credit Suisse in the title and you managed to ride through this flat. I think we'd all take that as a win. Do you think that that's a result of a lot of active trading on their part? Or do you think that they simply got the positioning right and that they're their buy-ins yeah. on the, the more senior debt, which had that spike, really just offset the losses in the AT1s? Yes, yeah, so that's that. This is my current project that I'm working on, um, and I think like what I always tell the analysts that report to me and that I, I help teach. Um, this stuff is a mosaic, uh, especially in fixed income portfolio construction. There are a lot of variability. There's a lot of variability to this and to the outcomes. Um, so, for example, I'll use a real clean one. Um, it's the one I currently have the most information on, and that's the MetWest Fund which only owned the seniors, didn't own any AT1s um, and did well. I mean, still lost 31 bips on the 20th, but did well, um, better than peers, better than anybody else on this list. And then it's return for that whole period. The week um, is among the best um, in the category, best on the, the page here. And that was because they only owned the seniors um, and then they were overweight the two year which if you recall, we haven't gotten to this yet, um, but obviously that caused a big ruckus in a lot of markets, the collapse in the two-year yield on March 20th. Um, if you were overweight the two-year um, key rate, that had a huge, maybe even a bigger impact on performance during this period than just your credit suisse exposure. Uh, now, some of these managers, this is where it gets into um, you know, trying to draw very fine distinctions, but some of these managers um, we've talked to more recently, um, and some of them were buying um, it, this, the senior unsecureds during this period when they were selling off. Um, other asset managers on this list were trying to sell everything. Um, and what happened was that AT1 liquidity, normally a fairly liquid market, $270 billion, um, that week, the week of March 13th, every day liquidity in that AT1 market and Credit Suisse AT1s just got worse and worse. And so by Wednesday, Thursday, if you hadn't sold by then, you were kind of stuck with it. Um, and so we get all of these different outcomes, which it's hard to parse this on the page, but sometimes you can see pretty clear performance differentials based on some of these factors. And it's our job, my job, and my team's job to understand the decision-making that went into one, building the position in the first place and why you chose what part of the cap structure you did. And then your decision making during this period, right? Were you buying? Were you selling? Were you selling because you weren't confident in your thesis and you freaked out? Or are you selling because your enterprise risk manager said, hey, you know, margin called it, sell it all today. Um, this is stuff we're still trying to figure out, you know, on the, the duration. Were you overweight duration? Well, if you were overweight the 20 year, the 30 year, and underweight the two year, that didn't help at all versus you know, where the key rate exposure was. So like, this is where we spend the bulk of our time. Um, and it's hard to parse, like I said, just looking at this, but you can see some pretty clear sort of examples um, or distinctions between, between some of these. Yeah, and, and worth pointing out, these are like half percent moves in bond portfolios in a handful in one of days, day. which so yeah. the sound these look like very small numbers. God bless diversification, but these are big moves in bond portfolios. Yes, these are yeah. This Good is point, yes. Dick. Yeah, yeah. Do you think some of these guys had had these riskier AT1 positions on, and were also long the two year as a hedge? They're like, um, yeah, okay, these are risky, but I've got a lot of pickup. Um, from owning them, and in the event that there's a bank run on these, then the two year is going to crash higher, and that's going to that's going to act as a really nice hedge. I don't think it was. Um, 
as explicit as that, but yes, right? So some of these, um, some of these on this list we know for sure owned the AT1s um, and were also overweight the two year. I haven't finished talking to all of these managers, which is why that column is, is pretty empty at this point. But I do know that to be the case for some of these, but it was not as explicit as a hedge against this trade. It was, all right, we, we like Credit Suisse. You know, these are, some of these pay really high coupon. Um, and oh, also the curve is massively inverted. And if we expect any sort of recession or Fed pivot or whatever, it's going to be most pronounced in the two years. So that's where we're going to, you know, lay most of our bet or most of our duration overweight on the two-year part. So, um, so yes. So they I were betting that, on an economic pivot anyway. They weren't really, yes. they weren't really buying that as a, as a specific hedge against some of their, their. I was going to say, Adam, you were getting into like the, the really long mustache guy yeah. in the corner <laughs> with a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> like he was like, or he was the, the most was getting along. I, like, I got to meet him. What's the size of the market in, of, of the, um, of the sort of uh, the secured, the capital structure that, that did so well, what's the overall size of that market? So 16 bill went to zero. What was the oh, appreciation for good... 30% appreciation of yeah. the other stuff? Was that half the amount? Oh no! I, I, know, I, I think it's it's more. It's more it's than more. One. Yeah, I think so. I don't have the number in front of me, but I'm fairly certain it's more. Those so bonds tend be, to be bigger. Yeah. Yeah. So that that would go in as a Swiss person sitting around that table, twisting my long mustache over that those days when things were happening. That would be something that you would probably we'd all be considering too. Okay, so we have these bondholders. And they're, you know, largely the same people. If we wipe out the AT1s, they're they're full and we don't have to, and we get our votes with our capital structure too, with our, our common equity. Yeah. yeah. So where are There's the opportunities? Did, well, first of all, did we, did we kind of cover the the bulk of um, the, the technical details and the drama around the- Yes. Okay. Yeah. So where where are the opportunities? Are there any opportunities left here, or has the AT1 market corrected back to where there's we're probably near an equilibrium, um, or are there still dislocations out there that some that some uh, bond funds have taken advantage of, are taking advantage of, and, and may represent tactical opportunities in the fixed income space? Yeah, I mean, I I don't think that the AT1 market has has fully corrected itself yet, right? It hasn't come back anywhere near where it was. Um, that being said, I think, I think, like we said before, the risk is no longer zero that events like this happen, but it's still pretty low. Uh, and I do think that market, um, just you know, based on what we're hearing from asset managers who invest heavily in this market, they're all, the consensus for better or worse is that, yeah, this is gonna come back no problem. This is, you know, market panic, market dislocation, not reflected in fundamentals, et cetera. That's the consistent ref refrain we've heard from everybody over the last two weeks. Um, this is a bit nuanced, so, but I'm, I'm curious whether um, um, the market has priced any particular jurisdiction with a higher probability uh, that that jurisdiction is will buckle the same way the Swiss buckled. For example, have the, has the market repriced uh, Euro um, jurisdictional bonds differently than, um, than, than uh, pound bond, like, uh, you know, UK I, jurisdictional yeah. bonds, that's, or is there any arbitrage going on there? Uh, I don't have the region by region or country by country breakdown. Um, to look at right now. I do know that, for example, US preferreds traded down sort of in sympathy, despite, yes, they fill the same role in the cap structure, but they are not necessarily equivalent in terms of their, their prospectuses and their contracts. Um, they traded down like maybe close to 40 or 50 points in sympathy with the AT1 market, um, which I think that's a, probably a reasonable arbitrage opportunity, right? Um, I mean, full disclosure, I'm not a, uh, credit or an equity analyst, but I think there is clearly, this is a baby with the bathwater moment. Again, this is this is the, the what we've been hearing from everybody. 
And I think eventually there will be some sort of tiering among these, right? As everybody reads through their, their docs a bit closer, parses the language of the various regulators and central banks, like that's happening right now. I just don't think it's the outcome of that is to be determined. And I think this is where, right, if there is an arbitrage opportunity, it's happening right now. We just haven't right. seen the outcome of that yet. Yeah, we'll see the results of that in, in um, hedge fund and in active bond funds over yes. the next three to six months, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be really interesting to look at um, March portfolios, um, which we'll start to get in April and May. But that's when uh, we'll be able to go back and take a closer look and see, you know, just how much things changed and. <laughs> But it weeks. doesn't look like we have an example of somebody who's making a career off, to, off, off of having called this perfectly, right? I mean, none, none of the funds that no. you're looking at no. had 2% spikes on the day, right? So it doesn't strike me that this is sort of one of those seminal events where you say, oh, well, I guess we have to listen to this guy for the next 10 years because he built his <laughs> performance on this three-day window, which happens. I mean, it happens in almost every yeah. market. But that oh, doesn't seem yeah. like anybody called this yeah. necessarily. I'm wondering if the opposite might be true, right? That, that the hedge funds <laughs> might have been out there earning earning carry uh, through capital structure arbitrage, long the AT1, short the senior sub debt, and uh, got got massively upside yeah, down on on that arb trade. That seems uh, more likely. And, and we're carried yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think I'll put this uh, to you all, right? So from our perspective, what we're th thinking about or looking at is where you placed your trade on Credit Suisse, why you did it. Um, but I think from, from your perspective, like the, the AT1 um, market as a whole, which that chart Dave that had up earlier showed, AT1 market as a whole until the end of last month um, had massively outperformed pretty much almost every other fixed income index over the last 10 years, right? And so from, how do you um, decide about building a portfolio where, okay, the upside is a nine and a half percent coupon, you're outperforming everything, even US high yield um, with the same volatility or not much greater, but the downside of the tail risk is you get zeroed, depending if you've read your docs enough versus, you know, earning a bit less and the senior unsecured or building the portfolio between those, like making that decision and where to place that your bets um, and it's something that this is ultimately what the outcome of all of this will be for us. But I want to turn around and ask you all, um, like if you were to place one of those bets or how you think about putting capital at risk versus the tail risk of a position like that. Well, I think it's a, it actually from the position of a manager is a question that, that managers kind of face every day, right? Like you, th there's all kinds of potential carry trades out there that you can put on to earn extra yield while the market is behaving normally, right? You know, in the back of your mind, if you've got any sense about you at all, that you are short a disaster um, option on yeah. that to earn that extra premium, right? And, but, yeah. but, you know, it's, it was it Chuck Prince who said, you know, while the, while the music's playing, you got to dance, right? So, yeah. you know, you've got all these active bond managers who, you know, the more prudent ones or, or the most prudent ones, let's say, may have avoided that space altogether because they weren't comfortable with the, the negative optionality on this kind of situation for 10 years and underperformed, right? Yeah. And, and therefore probably endured some kind of, um, asset bleed at the margin because yeah. they weren't participating. They weren't dancing while the music was playing. And, yeah. you know, to Mike's point earlier, right, you only see who's been swimming naked when the tide goes out. And so, you know, how does an investor look through a portfolio and decide whether they, they want to take these kinds of asymmetric risks in order to earn a potential, yeah. you know, whatever it is, half point, one point extra yield um, on the risk that you give it all back in a, in a few weeks when, when and if this particular catastrophe materializes. Well, I yeah. think the, just I want to add to that too, that the 
the manager themselves is is uh, bound by whatever restrictions are in their portfolio. So we come back to that mandate flexibility and portfolio agility. Uh, d- did the marketplace um, dictate to them what they were going to do anyway, given whatever structure they were in, their ability to even have or not have a hedge? And so putting a lot of guardrails around any of the decisions that they would have made, are they someone who will encounter some uh, some tracking error to some sort of benchmark? Are they able to to be more active in their trading? Again, coming back to that portfolio agility and mandate flexibility. Yeah. Um, and like like you say, Adam, it's, it's probably those who had the ability to shoot themselves in the face that shot themselves in the face <laughs> that were carried out, as, as we yeah. say. Um, but it's it's like there's a whole bunch of structural issues there, too, that fall into it as to. I mean, a yeah. bias in the market, I could hedge a position in some way, shape or form, but I can't mm-hmm. speculate on the other side. So I'm constructing this short disaster bond that I want to get a, a yield on. And is there another place where I could structure a trade that, that was a tail trade that paid off and yeah. the cost of that insurance was less than the cost, or the, the potential um, benefit of that insurance in a, in a doomsday. So I'm getting like a free carry. Yeah. But then you'd have yeah. to have a fund structured to do said thing like it, it's complicated. Um, yeah, I mean, you could have bought you could have bought um, far out of the money. You could have rolled far out of the money Eurobor, uh options and rolled those for 10 years, you know, and, and ate a very small portion of capital and um, for 10 years against your excess yield on AT1s. And the gamma on that would have been so unbelievably explosive uh, over those past over those two weeks that yeah. you would have been more than made whole, you know. Yeah, so there's, you'd there's have a windfall. Yeah, that's a yeah. long that's a long trade though. They get you they... <laughs> totally long trade, and who's got the the discipline to to Nobody. maintain that? No, no, care? that dude got fire, fired in year two. Yeah. Oh yeah, because this thing there is. There was a dude doing that. I, I ran into him. He was driving an Uber. He gave you a ride to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, this is this is the perverse incentives that we face in the asset management industry, Without right? Doubt. Like you get paid for 10 years for picking up nickels in front of a steamroller. Um, you, you gather more assets, you earn a lot more fees on those assets, you look like a hero. Um, because you're taking more risk, but the risk is hidden. And yeah. So, you know, if, if you're a less scrupulous fund manager or to Mike's point, you've got a mandate to take that kind of risk, but the investors don't know really the details of that risk that they're taking in order to earn that premium. Um, did, they, did they kind of ever really, even Brian stated, no. well, you got you to dig into your A21 and read it now. Yeah. Now? Right. You read it right. now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, one of the interesting things for us, like peeling back this event is going to take a lot of our time. We don't do this for every trade, obviously, that it would that'd be too, too much work, right? But we use it as a look through or a case study into decision making. And there's so many layers to this. To go back to example for a fund, let's say a fund had um, exposure in, in the seniors and the AT1s. Then their enterprise committee said, no, you got to sell it all now. Now, maybe they were only able to sell part of it. Maybe they sold the seniors and half of the AT1s or whatever the makeup is. But my first reaction might be, okay, well, okay, why did you, if you had this strongly held thesis, um, why were you so quick to sell it? And they say, okay, it was the enterprise manager. Okay, well, I get that. Then it might be second or third order. Okay, well, even though it was a complete reversal of their thesis, maybe they were able to sell enough that they still managed to lose less than if they had held it and kept stayed with their thesis, right? Like, how do we unpack that? It's just a huge, a huge question for us. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of luck and, and uh, policy in there, right? Like, who do you need to ask in order to take these kind of steps? What is your, what's the authority of your, of the manager versus the risk committee? Well, and, and um, how good how good your trading desk is too, right? Because yes, these are not yeah, yeah. these aren't exchange markets, right? So, like, yeah. if you're sitting on a couple hundred million dollars of AT1 debt, you don't know the right guy to call on a Tuesday. You're not getting the trade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. 
Well, that's uh, that's why the job is difficult and not everyone can do it, you know? Um, so, and hey, you know, you, you like these kind of puzzles, right? So you're, you're, you're uh, rubbing your hands <laughs> well, together, see, waiting to get your fingers yeah. dirty here. Yeah, yeah, it's just, this is the stuff where, you know, I, I think it's a, a wonderful window like into as a matter of decision making, right? Like you have a normal conversation with them. There's not much to talk about. You learn some stuff, you, you know, become friendly with them. But like this is the kind of event where you can actually understand or unpack like all the layers we just talked about, right? Like their their business or enterprise risk, like how they interact with them. You know, were their traders able to do something and another team's traders weren't like all that stuff, it suddenly crystallizes or at least becomes clearer in moments like this and so for for people like me and my team like this is where we you know you, you get a quarter for the stuff to write about yes oh but yeah at least yeah yeah well i you know we'd be remiss if uh in your capacity as um uh, associate director of fixed income at morningstar research we didn't ask you about your price target for dogecoin before we left <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think I would even know how to. No, well, I can Google it. But I don't. I'll go with zero. I go with zero. <laughs> <laughs> zero is always a good price target. Yeah. Oh, oh, you're playing that capital structure. That, that'll be controversial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All that engagement, right? Uh, in case anyone was uncertain, that was parody. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! I just want to be clear. Yeah, uh, yeah. what a great discussion, and uh, yeah, yeah. I think we should remind everybody: is not no no individual opinions on any of the securities mentioned here. And, you know, we don't we don't trade or hold any of this this these types of things. So, just uh, putting that out there, the uh, the, the compliance ending. But uh, all right. I, I, any other any final thoughts? Or are we are we? I feel like we're wrapping up. Yeah. I think we're, yeah, they, we got through everything I think we wanted to get through. I wanted to get through. I mean, this mm -hmm. was, I appreciate you having me. This is great. Fascinating. Oh, stuff, no, this man. is super insightful. Yeah, yeah. Really, really interesting. I, I um, loved it. Yeah. So Brian, mm -hmm. thank you so much, Dave. Uh, we didn't get into your role as financial futurist next time. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I just wanted to fly I'm on sorry. the bus. So let me take a <laughs> <front> seat. <laughs> I feel like I chewed up most of the oxygen. I'm saying. No, I just no, 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 no. That, that's that's the that, that you, you you're kind of supposed that to in this the, case. <laughs> you're you're McGregor. We're just yeah. I'm playing bass. We got Adam on drums. I'm a groupie. Yeah. <laughs> putting you at lead guitarist, but okay. I thought I was Keith Richards, but you're gonna make give Dave that. Oh, man. anyway. I'm all sorry. Right. I'm sorry. <laughs> he does have the guitar. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> before we waste too much more time, thank you to everyone who tuned in. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Dave. And um, thanks to everyone else who asked questions and commented. And uh, we'll yeah. see you back here next week. Yeah, propagate this message too, because this is not widely known out there information. So yeah. like and share as you will. Well, thanks for having us. And thanks, Brian. Thanks, guys. See ya. Most investors feel comfortable with their domestic equity and bond portfolios because they tend to thrive during periods of economic growth and low inflation. And we don't blame you. It's been a great ride. But it's a big world out there full of opportunities you may be ignoring. Sadly, we live in a world dominated by a fear of missing out, or FOMO. And in the last 10 years, U.S. equities and bonds have outperformed and generated massive amounts of FOMO. This hasn't always been the case. In the mid-2000s, the best performing markets were international equities, especially emerging markets, gold and commodities. So what happens if growth collapses and inflation becomes the new norm? Or what if the U.S. dollar collapses and U.S. assets are no longer attractive? What will the new FOMO markets be? And will your portfolio keep up or be left behind? Enter Rational Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation Fund, ticker RDMIX a strategy that is designed to thrive across different markets and economic regimes. Unlike most traditional strategies that keep allocation static and let volatility happen, adaptive asset allocation applies a proprietary systematic process designed to dynamically transition toward thriving asset classes and eliminate those that are not, all the while aiming for consistent volatility and stable returns. There's almost always a bull market somewhere in the world. Don't let yesterday's FOMO get in the way of tomorrow's opportunities. 
Instead, let adaptive asset allocation help you fill in your domestic portfolio gaps. To learn more, visit rationalmf.com and check out the Rational Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation Fund.